Okay, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. It's good to see you here this morning. I had uh, planned out some Equipping Hour messages that I thought would be single edition, kind of one morning Equipping Hours, and I thought this would be a really easy one. Um, unfortunately, this is turning into a series, so we're going to be part one this morning. I'll open in prayer, and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. What a joy it is to be gathered with your people, uh, to see faces resonating with joy in being together. We love how you prize believers' unity. We want to seek after that unity that you have bought with your blood, that you have governed by your word, and that brings us so much joy in this life as we walk this pilgrimage uh, unto our eternal home. And we pray that we would love unity. We pray that we would love unity amongst believers, that we would love the kind of unity that you provide and expect from us. And so we just ask for your help in that. And we pray for discernment and wisdom and a love for all that you love in this pursuit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for this morning's Equipping Hour is The Attraction and Dangers of Rodney King Theology. And you may uh, not be aware that Rodney King was a theologian, but uh, you may remember in 1992, after the acquittal of a number of L.A. Uh, police officers uh, on a trial accusing them of excessive force in the arrest and apprehension of Rodney King, uh, on the day that the, those men were acquitted, the, the whole city of Los Angeles erupted into violent riots. Those riots went on for about six days. Things were set on fire, people in the streets. And after six days, Rodney King himself took to the airwaves and said famously, I just want to say, you know, can we all get along? Can we? Can we get along? And if you were glued to the TV like I was at that time, uh, you may have felt like I did. You may have felt the things that Rodney King himself expressed. People had died, property was damaged, and you think, for all of our differences, uh, for, for all of the grievances that are even unsettled, for all of the polarization and the fighting and the division, no matter how deep those grievances, no matter how vast our differences, there is something in most of us that says, enough already. Can we just get along. That was Rodney King's cry. That is also the cry of many observers of the church, the church of Jesus Christ. Very often the cry goes out, can we just get along? If you've noticed church history, you've noticed the divisions, you've noticed denominations, you've noticed schisms, you've noticed infighting, you've noticed separations. Can we just get along? Ecumenism is the desire to unify Christian churches. It comes from a Greek word that means the entire inhabited world. It appeals to the idea that the whole world of Christians ought to be one. The ecumenical movement is the tendency or the conviction to move toward cooperation across denominational boundaries or it is the drive to drop those boundaries altogether to form unified bodies of Christians. What we're gonna look at in the next series of equipping our messages on this topic is why that is so attractive. Why is it so attractive that we drop denominational barriers, that we learn to get along with each other, that we drop our grievances, that we be one for common purposes? And we're gonna talk about why that is attractive. We're going to talk also about what the dangers of the ecumenical tendency are, and then we'll dive into some biblical answers to that every generational appeal to let's just get along. 
It seems like every generation experiences this in recent church history. You'll remember that there have been great divisions in church history that preceded our era. The great schism of 1054 AD where the East and Western churches split. You, have, you essentially have the difference between uh, the church based in Rome, which has become the Roman Catholic Church, and then the Eastern churches, which have then splintered off into Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, uh, Egyptian Coptic churches, and a whole host of others. In 1054 was that great schism, the East-West split. And while they said in 1054 that their differences were theological in nature, from whom does the Holy Spirit proceed, from God the Father or from God the Father and God the Son, and a few other theological uh, differences, the, the real issue was power and the centralization of power and which ecclesiastical hierarchy was going to rule the world. Was it Constantinople? Istanbul, Constantinople, which one is it? Or was it going to be Rome? And you have the Western church following Rome and eventually the papacy and the Eastern church uh, in, in Constantinople. You had, of course, the Protestant Reformation, and we like to put the date 1517 on there because that was the date that Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg and essentially sparked the Protestant Reformation. The word Protestant comes from the idea of protest. This is a protest of what the church had become in the 1500s, and the Protestant Reformation birthed, of course, many fragmented, splintering groups and denominations uh, of which we are a part. The number of denominations today listed by Answers.com is as many as 33,000 across the world. Of course, there are various definitions of what makes a denomination, but 33,000 separate denominations across the world. Why all of these fractures? Why all of the divisions? Why do we have all of these denominations? Have you ever been asked these questions? Have you ever asked them yourself? Maybe you've been in an evangelistic conversation with a Roman Catholic who will level the charge against Protestantism and say, Protestantism is the religion of schism and fragmentation. It can't be true. Look at all your denominations. Look at everybody disagreeing with each other. And perhaps you've heard that argument. The reason this is on our radar today is because of what has emerged in our own neighborhood in the John 17 movement. If you get on the John 17 movement website, you discover that churches in our area and men who uh, graduated from my alma mater, the Master's Seminary, are involved in a new ecumenical movement to unite Christians of every stripe and not only to unite evangelicals and Protestants of various stripes together, but to unite them together with the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the, the church that planted this church 20 years ago has joined this John 17 movement. On their website, they say these words, in honoring the prayer of Jesus, we exist to inspire, develop, and display love and unity among all those who profess Jesus as Savior and Lord. John 17 events are gatherings that are held in local communities, across cities, regions, nationally and internationally. They share one thing in common among Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Evangelicals, and Pentecostal charismatic believers. Jesus is Savior and Lord. They say further on the website, the philosophy behind each of these meetings is that fellowship begins at the feet where we love and serve one another, not at the head where there are so many differences of opinion. We must first get to know each other as friends and discover our mutual faith in Christ instead of focusing on our differences. Central to every meeting is the reading of scripture and worship and prayer and fellowship with one another. In regional and national meetings, topics are chosen, and each faith community is given an opportunity to share their views and answer questions. A guiding principle is, you don't have to compromise who you are to dialogue with somebody. The goal is not to convert everyone to one's personal view of Scripture, but to understand and respect each other's beliefs and differences. Our unity is found in the midst of our diversity. The Nicene Creed and Ephesians 4, 4-6 are our confession and our goal. John 17 participates in events with churches, denominations, and other unity groups throughout the world to encourage the members of the body of Christ to discover and love one another. 
We host an international event each year in Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona in the month of February. We also host a visit with Pope Francis each year in Rome for pastors, clergy, church leaders, and guests to dialogue with him about his vision of Christian unity and ask questions. This is by invitation only. You can see on their website videos by Tyler Johnson and Francis Chan, the pastor of the church that planted us and a fellow graduate of the Master's Seminary. This tendency is not new. The John 17 movement is not some new thing, some new idea that just came out in this generation. Although every time this happens, a new generation of young leaders says, here's this new thing we have to do. Let's reunify what has been fragmented. What God has brought together, let us not tear asunder. Let's sew back together those divisions. And the John 17 is just another recycled version of that same old thing. Early in the 1900s, theological liberalism was making its way into American churches. By the way, liberalism, when we speak of theological liberalism, technically is a denial of whatever is not credible to the fallen human mind. When you hear the word liberalism attached to theology, you're talking about that set of ideas which human reason and rationalism can agree with couched in the experience of religious observance. So liberal Christianity was the idea that anything supernatural, anything not credible to the rational reason of the fallen human mind can be dismissed, but I can still hold on to church going. I can still hold on to a collective social gathering for morality causes. I can hold on to the feel-good notion of going to church and being a part of a religious community. And it allows me to pick and choose which parts of the Bible I like. You know, the love parts I'm going to keep and the other parts I'm going to dismiss. That is theological liberalism. In the early 1900s, Protestant denominations were banding together to fight theological liberalism. And so Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and others got together and said, liberalism is the enemy. Let's forego our differences right now and let's show a a strong force of solid numbers against the threat of liberalism. And they banded together in organizations. They banded together in conferences. They began things like Bible institutes, Bible conferences, uh, Bible schools, and Bible churches. We are inheritor of the tradition, of the Bible church tradition that brought people out of the various mainline denominations fighting liberalism and joining common cause together. And the hope at the time was if we band together, we can rescue the liberal denominations. In the end, that turned out not to be fruitful, and they began to start independent, non-denominational churches. Now, that... Banding together at times produced faithful Bible teaching and conferences and Bible institutes and uh, colleges and in churches. But at times it brought Christians together of various denominational uh, brands that wanted to keep some of the features of their denominational heritage, but not allow it to be a barrier for cooperative efforts. And so when Christians cooperated together from various denominations, they dropped things where they had controversy. For instance, when do we baptize somebody and how do we baptize them? It became irrelevant questions. Why? Because if we're going to work together, we can't be fighting about things like baptism. Church polity became irrelevant. Do we have deacons? Do we have elders? Do we have deacons and elders? Uh, We can't fight about those things. But we can't fight about whether we have bishops and an ecclesiological hierarchy. We need to drop those arguments and work together because only when we come together and work together can big things be done. And that really is part of the motivation in all of this. In the early 1900s, it was uh, evangelicals banding together against liberalism. They saw that liberalism denied the truth of the Bible, denied things like... uh, penal substitutionary atonement, that Jesus came to actually pay for sin on the cross for sinners. They denied those things, and so those who believed those things would join together. They said their doctrinal differences that they had were not that important because the threats of liberalism loomed large. By the 1950s, however, evangelicals were joining with liberals because the threat was war. 
post-World War II, the threat of nuclear holocaust, and the threat of communism. Those became the big enemies. And now how do we show a, a, a large group of force as Christians together against those evils of communism, uh, socialism infiltrating the United States, and, and other evils? How do we fight the prospect of world war? Well, all Christians join together. Which Christians? Well, the liberals are against those things too. Yes, they might deny penal substitutionary atonement. Yes, they might deny the miracles. Yes, they may deny the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. But they do claim Christ, and so they are Christians, and they are fighting the same things we're fighting, and so we can link arms with them. And one of the byproducts of linking arms with them is maybe they'll start to listen to us. If, if they rub shoulders with people who believe in the authority of the Scriptures long enough, they might start to believe it too. And liberals went from being the enemy to being the ally. In fact, in the 1950s, J.M. Kick wrote a book describing the, the Protestant ecumenism uh, with its stated goal to fight against the looming enemy, which was Roman Catholicism. And so... Uh, liberal Protestants and evangelical Protestants were going to link arms together as a show of force to stem the tide of encroaching Roman Catholicism in the Western world. This tendency continued. You have institutions like the World Council of Churches founded in 1948, World Evangelical Fellowship founded in 1951, and then splinter groups from all of those that factionalized from those groups to try to unify the whole world under their own banner. And there is an endless parade of unification ecumenical groups that have emerged since then. Interestingly, in the 1960s, the Catholic Church attempted its version of ecumenism from 1962 to 1965, the Second Vatican Council convened, and they decided to drop some historic prominent features of the detritus of Middle Ages Roman Catholicism. Latin-only services were dropped. It was only in the 1960s that people all over the world were allowed by the Catholic Church to read the Bible in their own language, to have the mass on, uh, in their services in the common language. That was a new feature. They thought, we need to catch up to where the world's at. We're losing people, and so we need to allow more of the Bible and the common language in the Mass. Um, they also uh, dropped a number of uh, specific things that were barriers to Protestants. What they did not drop were, were the anathemas against justification by faith alone. But in the Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church sought to build bridges to Protestantism. One significant feature of the Second Vatican Council was to identify Christians of non-Catholic brands as separated brethren. Prior to Vatican II, the Catholic Church held that there is no salvation outside the church, outside the Roman Catholic Church, outside the overseeing of the Pope, no salvation. But Vatican II said, no, there are separated brethren out there, and we want them back. The goal was not to recognize the separated brethren as, hey, they're fine with Christ. The ultimate goal of the Roman Catholic version of ecumenism was to unify the entire world under the brand of Christianity, which centers in Rome. In 1994, you had the signing of the ECT document. You may have heard of this. This is the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document. A number of prominent evangelicals signed this document. Its uh, stated goal, I'll read for you here in a moment, but the signers that stand out in our minds uh, are men like Charles Colson. Uh, he was famous for going to jail uh, out of the Nixon administration uh, and started the prison ministry and was a leading evangelical uh, in the 80s and 90s. Bill Bright, the founder of Promise Keepers, signed it. Pat Robertson signed it. J.I. Packer signed ECT. ECT says this, this is from the uh, official Evangelicals and Catholics Together document from 1994. The scandal of conflict between Christians obscures the scandal of the cross, thus crippling the one mission of the one Christ. We are called and we are therefore resolved to explore patterns of working and witnessing together 
in order to advance the one mission of Christ. Our common resolve is not based merely on a desire for harmony. We reject any appearance of harmony that is purchased at the price of truth. And it goes on and says, We affirm all who accept Christ as Lord and Savior are brothers and sisters in Christ. Evangelicals and Catholics are brothers and sisters in Christ. The only unity to which we would give expression is unity in the truth. And the truth is this, there is only one body. We affirm the Apostles' Creed. We do know that God, who has brought us into communion with Himself through Christ, intends that we also be in communion with one another. The document goes on to say that we are bound together in contending against all that opposes Christ and His cause. That is the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document. It's much more lengthy than what I just read, and there are six more ECT documents that followed in subsequent years. And they all say similar things, some even more egregious. What a remarkable move has happened in the 20th century where uh, Christians thought we need to get together to fight liberalism, and then conservative and liberal Christians got together to fight Catholicism, and then Protestant and Catholic Christians get together to fight what? And you know where that goes. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church has been inclusivist and in increasing measure. You remember it wasn't long ago, Pope John Paul II uh, banded together the Western civilization and everyone under Christendom to fight communism, and the current pope is a communist. And these things just keep going in, in outward and concentric circles, ever expanding to include more and more people. I would contend that the end of this movement is universalism. That is the, the slippery slope danger. But there are far more immediate dangers just than the view that everyone eventually goes to heaven. The, the real danger for especially believing Bible-believing, regenerate, born-again, spirit-indwelt, evangelical Christians. Isn't it a shame you have to use so many adjectives to describe what a Christian is anymore? It used to be a bad word, little Christs, you Christians. And it used to come at a great price to claim that title. But now a billion people claim the name Christian. And we have to have ever-increasing lists of adjectives to describe who we are simply when we mean that we love Christ by new birth. You remember Promise Keepers, Bill Bright began that movement to get men to think seriously about what it means to be real men and, and to have integrity and to follow the Lord and filled stadiums with people all rehearsing a series of promises. Promise number six in the Promise Keepers list is this. A promise keeper is committed to reaching beyond any racial and denominational barriers to demonstrate the power of biblical unity. That's a, that's a pretty remarkable promise. I promised, anybody, will they, any, just confession time, anybody make that promise? There are people in our church who uh, give testimony to God's grace of having become born again at a promise keeper's rally. So um, we're, not, we're not saying that God has not worked in many of the things that we're talking about critically today. Um, but God is pleased to save any of us through blunt instruments anytime he saves any of us, right? That's not a credit to the instrument used. Uh, promise number six is really striking that the denominational barriers that separate people were often blood-bought. They were often paid for under persecution, under inquisition, at the stake. And they are often fought with Bibles open and robust conviction from the authority of God. And you no, know, we are committed as promise keepers to do away with those. Why? The stated purpose is to demonstrate the power of biblical unity. We'll, we'll come back to that thought. In 2009, the Manhattan Declaration was another attempt to, to get a bunch of people together and say, we're together. All Christians, we're together. And their goal was to get a million signatories in a month. Two years later, uh, they had about 480,000 
Still, that's 480,000 too many signers to the Manhattan Declaration. And the lowest common denominator, the, the binding unity in all of these ecumenical movements, seems to have been the declaration, Jesus as Savior and Lord. Anybody who names Jesus as Savior and Lord is in. Now, that's not a biblical definition of what a Christian is. It's not the biblical definition of what a church is. Uh, we'll get to those things in coming sessions. But you don't have to believe the Bible is true. You, you don't have to have a biblical view of repentance and faith. You certainly don't have to affirm justification sola fide, uh, justification by faith alone. Uh, you don't have to believe in substitutionary atonement. You don't have to believe that Jesus died in the place of sinners to actually pay for sin to satisfy God's wrath again. You don't have to believe any of that to be part of this Jesus as Savior and Lord coalescence. It doesn't stop there. There is a broader inclusivism that is a significant result. I mean, think about Mormons today who claim Jesus is Savior and Lord. And when they come to your door, uh, this wasn't true 10 years ago, it certainly wasn't true 100 years ago. But when they come to your door today, they will affirm Jesus is God. They mean something different than you mean. They will say Jesus is Savior, and they mean something different than what you mean, and they'll say Jesus is Lord, and they mean something different than what you mean by that. Well, what is the motivation from a Mormon standpoint? They want to be mainstreamed. They want Christians to think that they're Christians too. And while most of the series is gonna deal with what is the evangelical attraction, what is the attraction to believers for an ecumenical movement, there are certainly attractive features for unbelievers to an ec ecumenical movement. Um, Satan has skin in the game in this as well. But from the evangelical perspective, there is a slippery slope that inevitably takes place. And I, I think we're gonna take a little time and unfold the ministry of Billy Graham in, in coming weeks. But there was a, a remarkable interview that Billy Graham had with Robert Schuller where Billy Graham affirmed that people who have never heard about Christ, people with no access to the Bible, people in pagan cultures and atheists will be in heaven. Why? Because they've accepted Jesus into their heart without knowing him, without hearing about him, without confessing him. And Robert Schuller was aghast and said, I can't believe what I'm hearing from you. Are you saying that in your view, there is a wideness in the mercy of God? And Billy Graham affirmed, yes, there is a wideness in God's mercy. And this from a man who in the 1950s was preaching hellfire and brimstone sermons and there is only one way to heaven and you have to hear and name and confess and believe in Jesus Christ. There is a danger that comes with this ecumenical idea. And it's a big-hearted attraction that gets us there. And it is a dangerous idea. Coalitions coalesce around a lowest common denominator. By definition, in order to have a coalition, you have to stop insisting on ideas that divide you from other participants. You can't have a coalition unless you drop the things that separate you in your activities. Now, I prayed at the beginning of this session that we would prize unity. I don't want to lose sight of that. There is a unity that Christians must prize and must love, and the end of the series is going to get us there, I hope, uh, that we can talk about the kind of unity that God intends for his church, the kind of unity we ought to love and fight for. But what we're gonna do this morning is really just introduce the idea by thinking through what is attractive about ecumenism. What is it that tugs on our hearts? What is it that pulls the heartstrings of evangelicals towards broad coalitions, towards getting together, towards reproachment, where we uh, end our differences and we just go Rodney King? Can we all get along? What is it attractive to us about that? What motivates this ins almost instinctive trend toward ecumenism? First of all, I think John 17 is a key text. I want you to turn there. 
And we're really long overdue for a series in this monumental chapter. I'm not making any promises. I just think this chapter needs to be taught slowly, verse by verse, meditated on well. But I point you to John 17, verses 20 and 21. To Jesus' prayer, and we're going to drop in sort of to the middle of his prayer here. And he's praying in the upper room with his disciples on the night he was betrayed. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, these 11 before me, but for those also who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Here, Jesus is praying to his Father in front of his disciples, in front of the 11, and he's praying for unity. He's praying for a profound unity with a so that at the end. And what is that so that in verse 21? So that the world would believe. So that the world would believe that the Father sent Jesus the Son. There is a unity that if Jesus' disciples, Jesus' followers, and successive generations would own, that it would have a significant message before a watching world. That becomes for us, that, that prayer of Jesus, that so that in the prayer, becomes a significant motivation for an ecumenical spirit. Does it not? Jesus prayed, let them be one so that the world will believe. Oh, man, how is the world going to believe? We've got to be one. Do you feel that? that? That is a strong pull towards an ecumenical spirit. Now, we haven't defined who the we are. We haven't defined what that unity is. And we haven't even thought, talked through what the mechanisms are for the belief that the world might experience when such unity were displayed. But that is a significant attraction to this spirit. It is why the John 17 movement in our own neighborhood is called the John 17 movement. We want to answer Jesus' prayer. We're going to do this. Another attraction to this kind of ecumenical unity is simply that fighting is hard. Fighting is difficult. I mean, there are people who are contentious for contention's sake, the people that are always trying to pick a fight, brawlers, factious people that love splintering off. They, they would love to be one man all alone. I am a rock. I am an island. I have no need of friendship. I don't need other people. And if I offend everybody in the world because I have my own opinions and they stand alone, be that as it may. And there are others who love to have followers. And a way to gain some popularity and have a following is just to pick off some sheep from a church and get them to follow your ideas because you got something new to say and let me start a new faction with my own name on it. And there are people who are drawn to those things. But, but if you're not that type, you may well be of the other type that says, oh, why? why? Why do all these people have to go their own way? And, and why do we have to have all these theological nitpicking arguments all the time? We, fighting's just hard. Endurance in fighting for the truth is hard. And contending is just distasteful. <clears throat> we like generally to be liked. If all I'm ever doing is pointing out someone else's flaws, eventually people aren't going to like me. And then I won't have any friends, and I will be an island. And so continually contending is difficult or distasteful. Enduring in that is hard. And another attraction is simply that schismatics are bad. Schismatics are bad. Look at Romans 16. Schism is a break or a fracture, and a schismatic is one who makes a fracture. Romans 16, 17 Paul says, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Why? Because such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts 
of the unsuspecting. Philippians 3, 17 and 19, you can write down as another portion where you have people infiltrating the church, teaching bad things contrary. Now, they want to break off people after themselves. So a call to unity is a remedy to schismatics. But you have to understand a, a schismatic, biblically speaking, is one who departs from the truth of the scriptures. One who is contending for the truths of the scriptures is not a schismatic. Why? Because you haven't made a break between your ideas and God's ideas. You haven't made a break between what you're saying and what God's word says. The schismatic is one who has departed from God's word. The one who breaks away from the truth, from the faith handed down. So a call for unity is a, is a good call when we get unity defined correctly. One attraction of ecumenism is missions. Missions is hard. Recruiting teams of people to go do missions is challenging. Recruiting like-minded teams of people to work together to go do missions is nearly impossible. That's hard work. With all the people dying out there, with all the people without the gospel, with all the people without the Bible, do we have to be so particular about doctrine? I mean, can't we just drop some of the things that that Christians just fight about all the time, ignore those, and work together for the cause of the gospel where the gospel's not been heard? Look, that's a good impulse. That's a good impulse. It's big-hearted. It's motivated by people needing to know Christ. The problem with that has been seen in the last 200 years in missions. We've seen people from various denominations form teams and organizations and go to the mission field. And what happens when a Methodist, a Baptist, and a Presbyterian go to the mission field? Sounds like a joke. Sorry, there's no punchline. It's just tragedy. (laughs) I need to come up with a punchline for that. That sounded like a good joke. The reality is they get to Africa and they say, okay, here's some people. We just preached substitutionary atonement. Um, Now, uh, we got to baptize these people. Uh, Are you going to sprinkle them? Are you going to dunk them? No, no, no. They they, they don't need to be baptized. We, we, We baptize their babies. And you got three people with three different views of baptism, and they can't agree with one another. And eventually they just say, wow, we we can't be seen fighting here in front of the people that just came to Christ. They're they're new, and uh, they they wouldn't understand all the history behind all of these denominational barriers. Just drop it. And and so they don't teach baptism at all. Well, that's not biblical. I mean, that's right in the Great Commission. That's the mission's text, and it says the word baptizing. (laughs) And we're not going to talk about baptism because we missionaries on a team can't agree about it. And we're not going to talk about church polity. We're not going to talk about a biblical philosophy of ministry. We're not going to talk about uh, election and predestination. We're not going to talk about human uh, responsibility. And uh, we can't talk about any of those things because they're divisive and they promote disagreement. And, and we just need to work together. And missions did that. And missions did that for 100 years. And thought, look, lots of people have come to Christ on the mission field, and when missionaries returned generation after generation back to America, they said to their denominations, look, I've been, I'm a Methodist, but I've been working with the Baptists and the Presbyterians for 40 years in Africa, and we got along just fine, and lots of people came to know Christ. What does it matter? And so that was one of the forces that started to get denominations to drop denominational distinctives. In the early 1900s, you had a number of significantly different theological denominations, uh, Reformed churches and Methodist churches, merge and become things like the United Churches of Christ, where where they dropped uh, hundreds of years of divergent theological convictions and practice for a pragmatic concern to be together in order to win the world. They worked on the mission field, it ought to be able to work at home. Our witness is another motivation. How will the world be attracted to us if we are fighting with each other? Uh, Maybe you've heard this in evangelistic conversations. Well, you you guys can't get along. Why why would I want to join you? There are 33,000 denominations in the world. 
I think one attraction is uh, to have some tangible expression of unity. Right? We, we can talk about unity, and, and trust me, we will define unity at some point in this series. But sometimes we just want to feel like we have unity. We want some visible manifestation of it. So if we have an organization, a label, you know, the World Council of Churches, it, it just sounds so unified. Now, the, those people might uh, disagree with one another at every conversation, but if we have a label, if we have an organization, if we have this brand, that's, a, that's some sort of a tangible expression of unity, and, and maybe we answer Jesus' prayer just by having a label uh, over all of us. One attraction has been just the idea of the, the word ecumenism that comes from the, the Greek word for the whole inhabited earth. Well, there is a proleptic hope that is well-founded. There is a day coming when Jesus will reign on the earth and he'll be king and his doctrine will prevail. His truth will reign. He will reign and the world will be unified around it. That day's coming. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, your kingdom come. That means, number one, that it's not here, that we're not doing kingdom work now by bringing it about through our feeble efforts of what Phil Johnson has called a cosmetic unity a unity only on the surface, not a true unity. Listen, a true worldwide unity is coming. That should make our hearts beat. But the pull towards that very good thing better not let us short-circuit Jesus' true unity for some sham. One of the motivating attractions is the idea of middle ground. Middle ground. If you've ever been in a conversation with somebody where you disagreed and you were polarized against each other and you thought, well, we both need to sort of make some adjustments, let's just negotiate, and if you give a little and I give a little and you give a little and I give a little, and we'll meet in the middle. And so if you think in terms of mathematics, uh, two plus two is, well, eight and a half. But you say two plus two is four. Well, this is a bit of an impasse, isn't it? Because I really like eight and a half and you really like four. But if we're gonna get along, we just need to compromise a little bit and I'll shave a little off, I'll say seven and three quarter and you just come up to four and three quarter. And you see where this is going. Eventually you say two plus two is six and a half and it's not true. I don't know if the math was right on that. Somewhere in the middle. But that's not the determiner of truth. In fact, if one guy started at 2 plus 2 is 5 and the other guy started at 87 and you met in the middle, neither one of you were right and the truth was 4. You were both outside of it. That is not the standard for truth. What is the standard for truth? God's word rightly understood. And yet there is this impulse in the human heart to, oh, why are we fighting? We, we just need to get along and so I'll compromise and you compromise and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. There's another attraction in that which is similar, and that is uh, the French word rapprochement, reproachment. We don't use it often in English. It's a virtue uh, that, that if, I'm, if I'm willing to give up some things, if I'm willing to give up some convictional things, that actually is a measure of humility. And since unity is the goal, anything in the way of unity is non-virtuous, Things like biblical authority, biblical conviction, doctrinal distinctives, blood-bought denominational barriers. Those things can all be dispensed with easily if unity under the banner of a so-called love is the goal. And not abandoning those things is narrow and obscurantist and arrogant. And so there's this tug to be humble and virtuous in reproachment. Another motivating factor is just to have some common cause. Right? In the 1950s, it was the cause against nuclear holocaust, the cause against a, another world war. And so Christians all over the world need to band together to fight war. In America in the 1950s, it was banding together against communism. Uh, in our day, there are other common causes, abortion, uh, political ideas, a culture war, public morality, definitions of marriage and gender, etc. We just need to get together with all the people who agree on these things 
have a show of force, a show of numbers, link arms, and cooperate. And in order to do those things, we just got to have a little less strife about those things that separate us if we're going to get anything done. It is a pragmatic concern. Another pragmatic attraction is church growth. Uh, We can boil down doctrinal distinctives to lowest common denominators, and then we can have larger groups of people together in one place. And there's strength in numbers. There's encouragement in numbers. Small numbers and isolation is discouraging, but to be in a stadium filled with promise keepers all saying the same things and singing the same songs at the same time, man, that's so encouraging, especially a cappella. But again, that's cosmetics. It's not deep, and it is actually dangerous. There is, of course, the attraction in our postmodern mindset that contradictory truths are not actually contradictory. You can believe in justification by faith alone, and you can believe Roman Catholic doctrine at the same time. You can have one person believe one and one person believe the other, and you both say, yeah, we believe in Christ. You can talk to your Mormon neighbor and both say, yeah, Jesus is God. And you don't have to dive into what the Mormon means by that. He's one of many, and you're going to be God one day too, versus what you mean by that. (laughs) Jesus is Yahweh, the Son, in the flesh, unique The current trend is justice advocacy. If we're going to get uh, some definition of justice in our world, we need to link arms with everyone who wants to have a marshmallow definition of justice and everybody who's willing to fight for that marshmallow definition of justice together and call it love, we're going to be together and do that. And, And especially if someone names Jesus in the mix, that just, that really helps us all get together. Respectability is an attraction. If the world thinks that we're silly because we're narrow and obscurantist, because we're just hung up on our convictions, well, what good is that? How will the world ever listen to us until the world respects us? And so we need to buy some respectability by dropping those things, working together. Again, look, if a billion people all believe the same thing, the world's going to respect that, right? That is a significant attraction for evangelicals. There has been for some the thought that mainline denominations could be revived. So I'm going to stay in a church that doesn't believe the truth, that preaches the opposite of the truth, that preaches that which is opposed to Christ, that which denies and abandons the cross and exchanges it for every social activity under the sun. I'm going to stay there because I might win the day If we take out all the good influence there, then who's left? And the tragedy is in the 20th century, that has never worked, not once. There has always been a watering down of truth in an attempt to win a hearing for the truth, and eventually you're not speaking the truth anymore. We'll detail that uh, in the coming weeks. There is, of course, the attraction of having a broad influence of having relevance in the world, to fix the world's poor image of the church, to end isolation and disfavor. There is the notable goal of being charitable, to believe the best in other people and uh, just to give everybody a chance. There is the self-preserving goal to try not to offend. As we close this morning, I want to just look at a couple of texts We looked at John 17. I think it's going to be critical for us to think through Jesus' definition of unity and how that comes about. As a window into that, I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is a text that's often appealed to in ecumenical circles, especially Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, therefore there's no denominations. And by the way, if that was the intent of the statement, there is one body, that there would only be one branding of Jesus' representatives on the earth for all of church history. If that was the intention, then I would just challenge you to say, anybody who makes the claim that that's the goal, uh, 
go follow that claim and ask him, okay, what's the solution? What is the one body? And the Church of Christ would tell you, it's us. The Roman Catholic Church would tell you, no, it's us. And the Boston Church Movement would tell you, no, it really is us. In fact, the Boston Church Movement was a, a Campbellite. Uh, Campbellite doctrine was Churches of Christ, Disciples of Christ, and Christian Church trifecta, by the way. They all started out with Campbell's doctrine that says there's going to be one doctrine that will unify all Christians all over the world. You know what he said that doctrine was? Baptismal regeneration. The view that when you get, say, when you get baptized in water, that is the mechanism by which you are born again. And my Church of Christ friends in Tennessee told me, look, if you get T-boned in your pickup truck on your way to your baptism service, you're going to hell. If you believed at home, intended to be baptized, and didn't make it to the service, you're not going to heaven. Now, that is hardcore Middle Tennessee Church of Christ doctrine. And the Campbellite uh, fountain from which those three uh, branches sprung, all believed that baptismal regeneration would unite all the churches, and that very movement split three ways. <laughs> one outgrowth of that was the Boston Church Movement, and the Boston Church Movement put one church in every major city, or that was their goal, so the one close to me in California was the L.A. Church, and we met some L.A. Church people, and why are they called the L.A. Church or the Boston Church? Because they believe there's only one church in one city because Ephesians 4.4, 4, there's only one body. And if you look in the New Testament, there were no titles for churches like uh, Second Midway Baptist Church of the Free Will Covenanters or whatever. You know, <laughs> It was just the L.A. Church. And they told you, if you are not baptized with the express purpose of getting your sins forgiven in water in the L.A. Church, you're not going to heaven. So does Paul mean here that there is only one body and you got to go figure out which denominational brand that is? And that's not what he's after. Look at verse 12 of Ephesians 4. God himself gave apostolic doctrine, the, the, the New Testament doctrine that comes from the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, and he gave evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What is the unity enjoined there in Ephesians 4? It is the unity around the truth of the New Testament, bringing us into living actual maturity in Christ in that truth. Here's the bottom line on unity. We don't get unity by looking at each other, compromising until we get closer and closer and closer to some error in the middle. We get to unity when we are aligning ourselves with the truth of God's word, and the closer we get to the truth of God's word, the closer we will find ourselves to each other. That is a New Testament definition of unity, and it will find its full ex fullest expression under pastors and teachers in local churches that are faithful to God's word. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks, some more of the history. Eventually, we'll get to the dangers of ecumenism, and then we'll talk about some of the answers to it. Thanks for being here this morning. We'll see you in a few moments.